Hi everyone, welcome to episode 5 of Planet Studio Tutorial. It's been around 5 months since release of the last video. I took a bit of a break from my uni exams and then spent a lot of time flying gliders. During the time I've been away though, there's been quite a lot happening with Planet Studio and I'm still trying to get used to some of those changes. So in the meantime, this episode will be maybe a bit shorter and certainly more theory based. To recap, in the previous four episodes we've covered most of the user interface, basic procedural terrain and noise generation theory, how to produce unique and randomised template variations, edit atmospheres and water, change general planet properties, construct systems and manipulate structures. In this episode we'll look at procedural theory in more detail, introducing noise features like octaves, gain and lacunarity, domain warping and then turn towards procedural generation tools like remaps and masks. This episode will require a very basic understanding of noise, seeds, frequency and how the game produces terrain, so if you're totally new to this I would recommend reviewing the relevant part of episode 2. That's from around the 3 minute mark in to 9 minutes in. First of all though, let's introduce the advanced view. It's likely you've all used it before at some point, but I want to quickly cover a few of the useful tools and options that are available to us here. In addition to the randomizer dice button that you're familiar with from basic view, there are now these additional buttons. Add new modifier. Note you must have already selected something in the tree before clicking, so the game knows where to add the new modifier in the hierarchy. Add a new container. These are really identical to the substructure containers we looked at in episode 4. Duplicate selected modifier. Delete selected modifier. Show and hide empty passes. Don't worry about this tool at the moment. The next one is Show or Hide Data Flow Display. This is about the most useful tool in Planet Studio for procedural editing. It might take a little while to become natural at using this view, but it really is simple. From left to right are the data indices, or channels, 0 to 9. You can think of them as layers or individual memory slots. Most modifiers will take some input and produce an output, and this view shows these in each index. The input and output index can be changed by clicking on the modifier and moving the relevant slider. For now, just realise that if one modifier is sending information to be used by another modifier, they must share the same input and output index and have an uninterrupted data flow. Note how the game conveniently indicates inputs and outputs using the blue box for an output and this coloured bucket for inputs. You can even click and drag them directly to adjust the data flow. Finally, we have the loading time button. This isn't much of a concern at the moment and most of it is pretty obvious. I normally only use this to detect problems in a planet if it starts showing excessive loading times on rebuilds or if it causes freezing when moving the camera around. Just remember that the loading times for each modifier listed here are related to the position of the camera. In other words, the level of detail could be different from the terrain generated with those modifiers and if they aren't uniformly spread across the surface, you may find that you'll get a false reading in these values. Just bear that in mind if you're trying to decide on the fastest way to make a certain terrain. Using the advanced view will enable you to control more aspects of noise modifiers, so before we move on further, let's take a brief look at these. As in basic view, after clicking on a noise modifier, a pop-up box appears. In advanced view, this is much more extensive. As we can see for octaves, the first property we're going to look at, the input is now in the form of an integer box. Octaves are an easy way to increase the amount of detail in a noise modifier, but they can be computationally expensive. Each octave is another layer of noise with the same properties, but twice the frequency. Logically, the more of these layers that you have, the more time it takes to generate the noise, but the more detail will be produced. 
the amplitude or strength of each octave is multiplied by a value called gain. It is helpful to think of the amplitude and frequency at this point as a wave. So we're starting with long waves for the first octave and then getting shorter with each cycle or octave. Each wave will be half the length of the previous one, that is the frequency doubling, and the gain value will control how quickly the amplitudes change. When a gain of less than 1 is introduced, for example here the standard of 0.5, it makes the amplitude or strength reduce with each cycle, or octave. This is the most conventional use of gain as it simulates finer details of increasing frequency and reducing strength. It's also possible, though not always helpful, to make the value larger than 1. This will produce a growing amplitude with each octave layer of increased frequency or if you really want to get experimental, negative values can be used. Lacunarity is a slightly difficult property to explain, so it's probably best demonstrated. For any given properties, increasing it will increase the overall detail and sharpness of the noise. Decreasing it will have quite a similar effect to reduce the number of octaves. It will greatly increase computational time though and can also produce very rough or poor quality terrain if it's used too enthusiastically. So I'd recommend making small, gradual changes until you get the appearance you want, keeping the value between 1 and 3. Next let's look at domain warping. This feature is pretty intuitive and fun to explore so I won't cover it in great detail. All you need to know is that this applies distortion to the noise before it's finally output. It's a brilliant way to give a unique twist to a rather bland noise pattern. It is possible to add multiple layers of warping and also to change their priority, but do remember to keep an eye on generation times. I'd recommend using small strength or amplitude numbers and keeping the numbers of octaves and lacunarity as low as possible. A very good example of domain warping in action can be found in the lava template, in the case of the lava flow rivers. Rotation warps are a special case of domain warping, which deserves some extra attention. They can be used to manually move procedurally generated features to specific locations by inputting a rotation value for each axis, x, y or z. Let's just recap how the game generates actual terrain from the noise modifiers from a practical perspective. A noise output is plugged into the input slot of a generate height modifier, as seen here. This modifier then maps a value range of the noise to an elevation offset range for each vertex of the quad sphere. Let's say our input noise has a strength of 1. This corresponds to each vertex point having a value assigned to it between positive and negative 1. Suppose we now want to map this to mountains and valleys 10 kilometers tall and deep. The generate height is therefore set to have an input range from negative to positive 1 and a height range from negative 10,000 meters to positive 10,000 meters. Remember that neither of these ranges need to have these values, nor indeed do they need to be symmetrical as in this case. Some terrains are only positive, think raised plateaus, and some are only negative, like canyons. Here we see the noise has now been converted into height between negative and positive 10 kilometers. However, there is only so much that can be done with a single noise modifier like this. For truly controlled procedural generation of terrain, we need to use remapping. This is a topic which can get needlessly complex quite quickly, so for now let's limit the scope of this tutorial to linearly remapping one input. At the end of the day, most of the remapping you'll need to use fits into this category, at least until you start doing advanced stuff. 
Remaps essentially enable you to take a specific range of the input noise data and output it as another specified range. Let's bring up a diagram that helps explain how this works. So here I've made a diagram essentially showing what a noise would look like if it were to be plotted in the y-axis with its value and along the x-axis with time or really in our case we could easier think of that as distance along an arbitrary dimension, let's say distance to one direction along the planet's surface. Here on the y-axis you can see I've labelled a few key values 0 is our central line and then at the maximum and minimum here we have plus and minus 1. So from that we can see that this noise has a strength of 1. Now let's say we want to remap this noise. What would we have to do? Well we've got four key values really. The input maximum and minimum and the output maximum and minimum. Let's see what changing these values would do. In our first case, we're going to say our input maximum is going to be positive 1 and our input minimum is going to be negative 1. So we're not touching any of the noise here, we're taking in our whole range of data between positive and negative 1. We're then going to set our output values, indicated by the red lines, to be positive 0.3 and negative 0.3. Now what that produces is a noise of lower strength but the same shape. Effectively what's happened is this noise has gone from a strength of 1 to a strength of 0.3. But you can see no data has been lost. All that's happened is it's just reduced in size. You might be thinking, well that's rather limited usefulness. Surely all I'd need to do is set the strength in the original noise modifier to be 0.3 or even just alter the height being generated in the generate height modifier. And that's completely correct. This first case here is of limited usefulness. We don't use this one much. The second situation though is far more important. This time our four key values are going to have the same numbers but we're going to shuffle them around a bit. Our input maximum and minimum this time will not be 1s. Our input maximum will be positive 0.3. Input minimum will be negative 0.3. Our outputs though will this time be positive and negative 1. Now what this produces is a result of the same strength as we could expect from our output of positive and negative 1. Our result is going to be positive, negative 1 strength, so that's a strength of 1. However, the shape has quite clearly changed. We've now got these flat portions at the top and the bottom which are caused by truncation. That's just cutting off of data which is lying outside our input values. What I've then done in the middle here, just to make it a little bit easier to visualise, is I've taken this representation here and I've just squashed it down to have the same strength as our first case here. You can see here now really clearly the difference. Now some of these remap concepts might seem a little mind-bending, but if you think carefully about the results shown here, it does all make logical sense. By choosing to restrict the full range of the noise to a limited output range, we aren't changing the actual shape of the noise, we're simply reducing its strength, as seen in case 1. However, as soon as we select a limited input range, as in case 2, we're ignoring sections of the noise, in this case cutting off the lowest and highest portions of the data. While the finished result still has the same strength due to our negative positive 1 output range, the final shape is really quite different. The sheer number of possibilities that can be achieved using a single remap noise modifier and carefully adjusted settings with domain warping, for example, are almost endless. Advanced remaps, such as nonlinear remaps, can open up even more options. And while it might seem complicated, they all work off these same simple foundations that we've covered here.
But enough theory, let's put our new knowledge into practice with the linear remap modifier. You can see in this simple test setup we're passing the noise through a linear remap modifier which I just added, then into a data visualizer. This will give a clear indication of how the noise output from the remap changes. First, we'll allow the noise to pass through the remap without making any changes. So our from minimum, from maximum, that's the input minimum and input maximum. And our to minimum, to maximum, that's output minimum and maximum values, have been left at minus one, positive one, minus one, positive one. And as expected, no change in the noise. Now let's see what happens if we invert the noise. So we're going to leave our input values the same, but our output values we're going to switch the signs of. You can see what happened here is that the patches essentially switch colour. When we check over on our debug visualizer, we can see that positive values are being represented by the yellows and oranges, zero is being represented by black, and negative values are being represented by this blue to purple color. Let's switch that back to make sure that we get a clear idea of what's happening here. Now if we take the full range and remap it to a restricted range, so this is the first case that we saw in our diagram. Our two or output minimum is now minus 0.3 and our output maximum or two max value is positive 0.3. The planet just got a whole lot darker which would suggest from looking at our debug visualizer and from our current knowledge that the amplitude or strength has just been reduced and that does indeed seem to be the case. The numbers have all got smaller the colour values shown in the debug visualizer have all gone nearer to zero or black. Finally, let's do what we saw in the second case of our diagram. We will set the input minimum to be negative 0.3 and the input maximum to be positive 0.3. Let's see how this changes the values shown with the debug visualizer. Immediately you can see there's a very dramatic change occurred. When we look at our visualizer we can see that the values have changed. We're now getting both positive and negative one values and all of these gradients are a lot sharper. This is once again what we saw in the second case of our diagram. We've truncated the noise so that the smoother points are missing and instead we have these larger flat areas at the maximum and minimum values of positive and negative one. Now this setup which is the limited input range mapped to the full output range. I use it a lot in planet editing and it's the main way that strongly defined patches of terrain or colors are produced. Just remember though these values that I'm using here they don't always have to be these values. Uh, you could use any magnitude, these wouldn't have to be the same. You don't always have to do this negative and positive pair. It could be fully positive, fully negative. Every different terrain type will require a slightly different remap. Before we move on further, I just want to show how the data that we're looking at with the debug visualizer connects to real life terrain changes in the generate height modifier. So what we're going to do is, turning off the remap to start with, we're going to just simply pass this noise through into our 10 kilometer high generate height and see what that does. So this is much as we would expect, we're getting this bumpy noise all over the surface of the planet with no particularly defined terrain formations. What we're then going to do is enable this linear remap again and then rebuild the planet and see what it looks like. Now don't be fooled by this apparent change in strength. The strength has remained the same. It's just that the distribution of the noise without being remapped only has very few values that are actually positive or negative one. <laughs> 
What I'm going to do now is make this remap even more harsh, so we're taking a far smaller range. And this is where you can begin to see that this terrain could be useful. Going then to here and reducing the height of the terrain, let's say to only be negative 2 kilometers, maximum height being 0, this looks far more useful for use on a planet. A more advanced tool for remapping noise is the Remap Curve modifier. Let's take a look at how that works. Here I've added in a Remap Curve. Clicking on the Curve Preview will open up the Curve Editor. For the most part it's very self-explanatory. The game is interpolating a curve between points placed by the user. The points have x and y coordinates, and they can either be dragged around using the x and y axes as guides, or more precisely placed using the input boxes on the right. Points also have curve handles for easy adjustment of the curve produced. For a linear remap, the line will logically be linear, or a straight line. Now let's take a closer look at what the values here actually mean. The x-axis represents values for the input, and the y-axis represents the new value that the data will be remapped to in the output. If the section of the x-axis used is smaller than the total range of the input noise, and clamp is selected, the outlying values will be truncated to the maximum and minimum of the new range. And you can see here the same familiar theme is developing. I do feel like it's really important to discuss and understand exactly how the curve remap tool connects to the linear remap modifier and the theory in the diagram that we just looked at. The best way to show this is to demonstrate how the x and y coordinates we assign to points at the end of this linear curve can be directly linked to the linear remap maximum and minimum values. Remember our remap which outputted a new truncated noise shape while maintaining the same strength as its original input. Let's see if we can reproduce that in the curve remap. Now thinking logically about it, our minimum input is minus 0.3. So that will be this x value of our first point, which you can see here I've set to be negative 0.3. The maximum input is positive 0.3, so that sets the x value of our second point here, 0.3. At the minimum input, we want the minimum output to be a value of negative 1, which we've set here. This sets the y value for our first point. Finally, at the maximum input value, we want the maximum output value, which in this case will be 1. So we have our points set up here. We have our minimum input, 0.3, maximum input, positive 0.3, minimum output, minus 1, maximum output, positive 1. Now we can go back to the main planet editing view and switch between the two remap modifiers we made. The view is currently showing the result of our linear remap here. Let's try activating our curve remap and rebuilding the planet to see what happens. And as you can see, the view didn't change. They're identical, and it's no coincidence as they're both performing the same operation. Now, don't worry if it doesn't make complete sense immediately. It might be worth skipping back to the diagram we looked at a few minutes ago, or maybe making some notes on paper. I promise remaps will become second nature once you've worked with them for a while. It's a complicated topic, though, and quite difficult to explain and grasp the first time. But there's one key topic which we've left uncovered, namely how we control where the noise and terrain are placed. Of course, there is the obvious answer of biomes, but I am trying to steer clear of them for the time being. Creating biomes and editing biome distributions deserves an episode of its own, so I'll be covering that in the next instalment. Until then, I'm assuming that viewers are working with templates that already possess suitable biomes.
However, it's possible to customise the distribution of a noise modifier within a biome by use of something called masking. The basic idea of a mask is enabling the user to leave some parts of the terrain or planet untouched while the noise is applied to other areas. Luckily, masks are really simple to get working, and now that you have the remapping knowledge we've just discussed, you'll be able to apply it to get a noise layer ideal for use as a mask. Areas marked as 0 will have none of the mask noise applied, areas marked as 1 will have it applied at full strength. Now, as these masks are, as we said, always in the range of 0 to positive 1, this already sets the output bounds for our remaps. Thinking back to the previous information, the output bounds would correspond to the maximum and minimum y-axis values on the curve remap, or the two values on a linear remap. Let's get this set up. So we have here a second noise, which I'm calling mask noise for convenience. We'll disable everything and just visualize that with our debug visualizer. So this is the clear unremap noise. We can see here we've got negative values shown by this blue here, uh, quite a lot of values quite close to zero, and then some weak positive values. This really isn't what we want. We want it to be remapped to have an output between zero and one. So let's bring in our linear remap, enable it, and straight off we can say that our output or two value here for the minimum is zero. Now using these truncated input values worked very well at making the noise details sharper and more defined. So what we'll do is leave these as they are and update. Now this is a lot more suitable for use as a mask. You can see we've got some areas which are marked as zero, some areas which are a full strength of one, see here this light coloured pink is a full strength of one and a mix of values in between so I'm very happy with using this as a mask. Now all that we need to do is apply the mask. We're going to enable our original noise and this time go down to our mask which currently says unused, this slider here. We're going to set that to use the input of zero. You can see here we've got a green bucket appearing on our noise as shown in the zero index in our data flow. You might be a bit worried about having all of these going down the same uh, data flow index but it really is okay unless we wanted to access this mask let's say further down and then we'd need to move it across and do some more clever things with our inputs and outputs but for now it's completely fine to have them running down this same channel. So we now have our mask being remapped to make it into this shape and we're plugging that into our noise. So what I'm now going to do is visualize what this noise looks like with the mask applied. Now this is really quite an exciting result. You can see here we've got the original noise that we've been looking at since the episode began but now there's whole areas which have the value of zero, these large black patches. Let's also use the generate height modifier to see what this would look like in terms of terrain. And here we can see we've now got a mix of these plains and then really tall mountains. It's quite an exciting result for me. Of course this would need a little bit more work before being published, but this is really starting to take shape as a planet. This topic connects into one of the final things that I want to mention, and that's modifier naming conventions. There are many different ways people approach this, but I'd encourage you to find a method for naming modifiers which works for you as soon as possible. Early naming of modifiers, for example when I set mask noise instead of noise, is really important part of the development process of a planet, and it'll save a lot of time as it reaches completion. I try to take additional notes while I'm working as well, so if I'm too hasty in naming a section of the code, I can still go back and decipher its function. And finally, I'd strongly advise that you continue saving your work each time you change something on your planet. There is always the undo button if you save something which you don't like, but if you're not saving your work regularly enough, 
you'll sooner or later have a crash and those will always occur at a bad moment. And on that note, it's time to wrap up episode 5 of Planet Studio Tutorial. It's been quite a wild ride and rather intense on theory and user interface, but I really do hope you've been able to follow along and learn some new techniques in the process. We looked at noise generation in more detail, considering octaves, lacunarity and gain. We then investigated remapping and masks, introducing you to the linear remap modifier and the curve remap tool. We then looked at how those two connect together and the foundational theory which underpins remapping. Finally, we discussed a few additional ideas that can save time and effort in more complex codes. I look forward to seeing you in the next instalment of Planet Studio Tutorial where we'll dive into the world of biomes.